Hello. Welcome to season nine. Welcome back to Center Saint Sister. This is a podcast that values connection and curiosity, growth, and telling the truth. And my hope is to introduce you to people that show you new ways to love, new ways to think, new ways to live. Here we are always trying to find our way back to the God that loves us just as we are. I hope that you like and review and subscribe. But most importantly, I hope you hear something that lets you know you are loved and helps you love one another. Welcome to Center Saint Sister. Center Saint Sister exists because I believe that the love that God gave first deserves a response. Center Saint Sister exists because I believe that oneness is how the world will know. I believe that one of the most beautiful things that Jesus bought us with his death is unlikely love. Center Saint Sister exists because I believe in a gospel that restores the broken and bears the heavy. And I believe that there is something special something different, frankly, something called about the people who claim Jesus to embrace his people and love them as ourselves. Center Saint Sister exists because I believe in Christians to be able to sit knee to knee with story, to get closer to story so that this place, our place, can become a place of redemption and forgiveness and restoration. I believe that we uniquely can do this. Jesus and his new way to live showed us how it's done. And there is simply no easy way to have a conversation about race. And there are a lot of reasons for that. We come at race from different perspectives and with different experiences. There are attachments to words and ideas that instantly make us feel things. And oftentimes we use those words and ideas wrongly and end up miscommunicating. Many of our experiences trying to discuss race haven't been pleasant. We're insecure. We're defensive. Maybe we've been hurt. But what I love about this community, our community, is that we have made a commitment to one another and to God to show up committed and kind. We confront race a lot on Center Saint Sister, and they are some of the most listened to episodes. We have made peace with the starts and stops and new beginnings of growth and change. And we've made peace with it being a little messy because redemption usually is. Today's guest is Tyler Merritt of the Tyler Merritt Project. I truly do not know someone who takes on systemic racism with more conviction, connectedness, generosity, and love. He is passionate about what it means to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly. You're going to love this conversation. Pink Salt Riot creates products that are created to be reminders to show up authentically as we are and live into the mission that God has exactly for us. Pink Salt Riot creates jewelry and greeting cards and lifestyle goods and gifts that anyone who loves Jesus would love. All of these products are made with the hope of pointing us back to radically standing in the truth about what God says about us and that we are worthy exactly as we are. We can anchor our daily lives to God's love and faithfulness. And you guys, Christmas is just around the corner. I know that there is something perfect for someone you care about at Pink Salt Riot. Follow them on Instagram and TikTok or PinkSaltRiot.com. Tyler Merritt. (laughs) I am so going to try. I'm going to try really hard um, to not pretend that we are huddled up in our favorite restaurant in some corner booth until 2 a.m. And Sweet. remember instead that we are very much on a podcast and mm-hmm. that we have a limited amount of time and that that people are listening. Um, because what I really <laughs> want to do is tell you every single thing that you've ever said that has made me laugh, cry, jump up and down, pump my fist, shake my fist, um, you know, just just all of all of the things that you're so capable of initiating in people, these emotional responses. Um, But you have reminded me of myself in so many ways. You have taught me things that are completely foreign to myself. And um, there is something about your way, Tyler, that is so accessible. Um, There's something about the way that you communicate that leaves no gaps, even though it is very much on the internet or in a yeah, book. Yeah. Um, you just make yourself very accessible to others while leaving room for other. And I'm, it's just a huge, huge gift of yours. Welcome to the show. I am so, so grateful that you're here. Allison, thank you so much for all of that. And let me say, um, 
Hey, I'm honored to be on your show. I love that you are creating a community of people that are able mm -hmm. to come listen and learn about a multitude of things and mm -hmm. that you are giving transparencies to where you feel you need to be transparent in. Mm -hmm. And I think that really affects the way that people relate to you, the way they listen to you. Mm -hmm. They want to listen to you mm -hmm. because they know that you are keeping it 100. So awesome. um, I'm really glad sweet. to be here for a million and a half reasons. <laughs> and trust me, I am right there with you. It's going to be, it's very hard for me when I'm on a podcast, not to act like we're not just chilling yeah. in some coffee shop somewhere. So okay, well then coffee shop it is. I mean, let's, I let's mean, just The hard part about that is, is, is when that happens, I find myself going, Dude, is anybody going to want to listen to this? Because it sounds like we're <laughs> right. just hanging out. Right. You know what right. I mean? <laughs> I say yes. Um, so, Tyler, I became aware of your work in, in 2020. Now, of course, you have been, Tyler, meriting it since birth, right? You yeah. have been, um, you know, known really by the masses, maybe not this level of masses, sure. but you have been doing creative things for a, a very, very long time. But it was in 2020. Um, and with Before You Call the Cops, which was this really simple, no thrills video um, that you made in an attempt to humanize yourself right. as this 6'2", dreadlock sporting, bandana wearing um, African-American man. And we'll get into all of that. But since then, you have written two books, I Take My Coffee Black and A Door Made for Me. And you are an advocate. You're an activist. You're a Christian. You are a creative misfit as a vocalist and an author and an orator, an actor. And um, you are a boyfriend, a son, a brother and friend. And I love having in, um, guests introduce themselves by telling us a little bit about who and what what you love who and what do you love Tyler um let me tell you I, it, simply put I love people I am a a huge huge fan of people and that's mm -hmm. kind of the anchor into everything that I do mm -hmm. um I've built a, a life around really trying to see people and not just on a casual oh there you are but on a true genuine um way of kind of getting to know who you are, hopefully to build some proximity. Um, and I, I really do truly believe that if we take the time, as difficult as it may be, to look past the outer shell of who we are and really get to know one another, to build some empathy for each other, mm. to, like how you just said, I am a a son, a brother, a teacher, all of those things. And I'm so much more than just what you might see walking across the street. Yeah. And my hope is that um, the more that we see each other, the more love we put out into the world. Yeah. 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 You're so you're really, really gifted in this department. So it's it's only right that you have a lot of people watching you do it. Um, OK, so, Tyler, do you mind if we start out with some silly stuff? We we can be silly for. I mean, we've all got some time. heavy places to go. Like you know, yeah. Don't don't be worried. But um, you are an avid banana hater, and I just have questions. I I I would like to make sure. Are, have you eaten the right banana? See, it's all it's people like you that try to well, come at me and be like, you know negotiable? what? If you just eat the right banana, it's the right banana, Tyler. I'm afraid you know that we have not researched this enough. Uh, I, are, are stakes in the ground? Is it negotiable? Is there wiggle room? Listen, you know, Allison, I thought this was going to be a friendly conversation, but obviously. Well, <laughs> listen, I was willing to get past the Alabama thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Ever since a kid, like my mom will even tell you, like, I didn't want to eat bananas when I was a kid. You yeah. know, like, you, you know how you just feed your banana. kids, whatever. Yeah. When I was a baby, my mom would feed me bananas and I would spit them out. I don't, yeah. everything about bananas are disgusting. Everything, mm. the color, the smell, the shape, the everything. Mm. Don't get nasty, but the shape's weird too. All of it's bad. All of it. All of it's bad. All it of should it. not. It actually shouldn't surprise me that I'm a banana advocate because I, you know, the yellow Laffy Taffies that everyone mm -hmm. like promptly throws in the trash after they get them in their Halloween pail. Sure. Like, all of the neighborhood kids bring them to me. They're my very favorite. So. That is the only banana-y thing I can do is that Laffy <gasps> Taffy that is like, but that's not even banana-y. We found something, Tyler. See, look at that. But that's this just is a like perfect yellow microcosm. plastic. That's yellow plastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's okay. Oh, hold on. Banana pudding, still a no? No. It's a no. Mm. 
Okay. It's too much. It's Fine. you know what you know what I can't eat. I can eat banana bread if okay it tastes more just like warm chocolatey chip bread. <laughs> That's, if you disguise the banana with chocolate. Okay. Right. There's no banana in my ban- banana bread. It is on. <laughs> um, okay. So I was reading, um, which, okay. I was reading, I take my coffee black and which I, oh, I loved for so many reasons. You so artfully, you so effortlessly combine pop culture, history, the people you love your very personal details into this like totally seamless treasure. Like how in the world? And and by the way, by the way, I read it firstly, but then to prepare for this and to remember a little bit, I I listened. Friends, go yes, friends, <laughs> go get the audio audio book. Take a walk around your neighborhood. Enjoy. Do not. You don't need to write me a thank you note. It's fine, y'all. Oh, you are such a performer. Okay, I digress. So um. I feel like it struck me when I was reading um, how early you knew just who you were. Now, I know that there are always struggles with identity, and I don't mean sure. to imply that there wasn't any work involved sure. or that, you know, there weren't other areas. But um, I love how early on you embraced your inner artist. Um I, yeah. I know a lot of people, myself included, that have been hesitant or reluctant to call themselves an artist. And as I was listening to the ways that you really came alive through music and performing, I couldn't help but think how lucky you were to be set on a yeah. creative journey so early. Can you tell us a little bit about your creative journey and embracing your artist? Yeah. First, let me say this. Your reaction to the audiobook, I love because people who don't, who haven't listened to the audiobook, they're like, oh, cool, yeah, sweet, and then they listen mm-hmm. to it, and they can't mm-hmm. help but to not have that reaction. It's I have chills. All I wish that I could show you them somehow. I don't know how. I have chills all over. Yes, <laughs> I wish because I love I, and I love when I signed my book deal. I told them I said there's a couple of things that are non-negotiables. One, mm. you need to allow me to cuss as much as, as I want in my book. Okay, yeah. Uh-huh. And two, um, I have to do the audio book, and with the audio book. They just let me have my way. I told them that mm. I wanted to sound somewhere between a podcast and a radio mm-hmm. show. Yeah. Plus just like a sitting down face to face, you know, all of those things. And they let me work in my engineer, Jen, into the storyline. Yes. And uh, sound effect with sound effects and Jimmy Kimmel being on it and my mom and dad being on it. Um, they really so allowed me to kind of have my way. Yeah. And uh with that, I was able to give you this full blown story that ends up reading better than the book, uh, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, um, I agree. Yeah. I hesitate to say that because it's all gorgeous, but man, I loved it. So it was a t- completely different experience. Well, I definitely feel like you have to get the hardcover for mm-hmm. sure. Even if mm-hmm. just to sit on your coffee table is a conversation piece, Yes, but definitely get the audio book. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Love it. Uh, Cause we have a blast, but to answer your question, so I'll tell you this, um, as an only child, I think I always had this artist piece in me that was just in there, right? Always mm. like just making up stories or entertaining myself. Mm-hmm. But as I talk about it and I take my coffee black, I didn't realize that like acting was a thing you could do for yeah. like real, you know, yeah. how I talk in the book about how I genuinely used to think like Silver Spoons was just a story of like a yeah. rich white kid in a house riding around uh-huh. in a train that we just got to watch, you know, yeah. Yeah. or or different strokes were just these black kids that got adopted and we just happened to get to watch the story. There happens to be a camera in their kitchen. It happens to be a camera. Like for some reason in my mind growing up, it didn't click to me that like that's a profession. Mm-hmm. Like if I hone those skills and really lean into them. Mm-hmm. that's something I could really do. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, it started with me rapping in high, mm-hmm. in junior high to kind of protect myself from games. From games and yeah. then that turned into finding out I could sing. And then that turned into acting and that turned into getting scholarships and um, learning about musical theater, which completely, absolutely changed my life. And the escapism that musical theater was ended up being something that I I could never be more thankful for in my life. Yeah. And you're right. I found it at a, at a young age, but I think I was just in tune with it because it kind of helped me dream. 
It kind yeah. of helped me escape a little bit. And not that I was in this world where I felt like I needed constant escape. It's just, I remember the first time I sat down and listened to Miss Saigon, the musical, yeah. after a girl gave it to me and like forced it upon me. And I remember sitting in my den in Las Vegas, listening to it and just getting lost. And I remember in that moment, Allison, thinking like, this is over for me now. Like, mm. this is it. I'm changed. This is, I got to do this now. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, it's so beautiful. I love it so much. I um, I recently started acting, and there's something about how a performance can never really be perfect. Like, there's yeah. always some note to get better. There's always some line to deliver just writer, you know? And sure, so there's sure. something about the impossibility of perfection and the calm acceptance of that, where it's right. like, if, I, if I'm writing or speaking, it's like, I have some experience with that, and I expect a certain level of expertise. But sure. like you, because of acting, it's like, oh, I don't know how to do this. And so there's something about the impossibility of perfection that right. allows me to just try and like... Yeah. perform past my sensor, you know, like to be fully present, just be fully present, perform past your sensor, do it. And then it, it, it makes you ask the question, like, what would you do if you didn't have to do it perfectly? 100%. You know? 100%. It's so exciting. And then when you can see something that almost feels like perfection, mm -hmm. you're in mm -hmm. awe, you're lost yeah. in it. Like, yeah. um, I can think of a couple TV shows that I've watched over the years that I've thought like, this is about as perfect as a piece of art can be. I just, yeah. um, the most recent show that I've watched, that I felt that way is, I don't know if you ever watched the bear. Did uh -uh. you ever watch that? Okay. No. Man, it's like an okay. eight episode. Um, People that are listening to this who have uh -huh. seen the bear are all amening are, with me. Right they're now. jumping up and down right now. They're yeah, jumping uh -huh. up and down. Cause they're going, he is so right on that. Okay. Um, the bear, I believe it was, um, on FX and now you can watch it on Hulu, but it's just okay. eight episodes of, telling a story and it's after I was in the midst of watching it thinking this is arguably one of the most perfect things I've seen on television mm -hmm. in years mm -hmm. and then on the stage um uh, I'm a huge like I said I love musical theater so I spent a lot of time in New York um right now on Broadway there's the musical MJ the musical yeah it's okay. about it's a it's a Michael Jackson the musical and it's basically a small take on a very small piece of his life and there's an actor by the name of Miles Frost who's playing MJ. And it's arguably one of the most perfect performances I've ever oh. seen. And so getting to watch those yeah. things yeah. Um, as an actor, you find yourself just always wanting to be better and to grow and reach yeah. that thing you're talking about. There's always well, something more we can be doing. The mutuality that happens on a stage, like with other people, like there's right. such a connection um, just between souls that happens too. So, um, I know. So I was in, I was teaching special ed, um, as in my twenties, which was noble work, but, uh, and which I loved for a ton of reasons, but I wasn't fulfilled. And so I was escaping yeah. my life a little bit and I was spending a summer in New York and somehow I ended up with really good, um, seats at rent, which was the first, mm -hmm, which was the first musical I had ever seen. And I don't remember why I had really good seats, but I did. What but, year uh, but was I'm, this? Oh gosh. Oh, okay. Let's see. 2002. 2002. So was this the revival of Brent or the yeah, action? I, I think so, the revival. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 It had to be. Okay. Um, But I was completely captivated. Like mm. the beauty, mm. the art, the scandal, yeah. the love. Like I was, <laughs> I don't you know, here I am like 10 feet away from it. I was complete. And, and then, but what it was happening is that I was looking at these people, these 20 somethings. And I was in my 20s too. And I was like, right. man, these people knew what they wanted. They went after it and they are doing it. And it was right. so inspiring to me. Like here are these young people and they're so forcible. They're mm. so like inspirational. And and literally it wasn't until my 40s that I really kind of, you know, captured some of that, that bravery. Um, okay. Yeah. So I know that you have made the friends of a lifetime in your performing arts circles. Um, you know, just, I feel like as artists, there's these relationships that are based yeah. in a lot of ways on tolerance. Cause we're all a little weird, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's like, <laughs> it's like, 100%. okay, well that's the way you're weird. And this is the way <laughs> that I'm weird and we can all just be, be weird together. And um, in addition to these performing arts circles and, and wonderful relationships. You also grew up in Vegas, which by the way, I didn't know that anyone like grew up in Vegas. I mean, I knew a lot of people Who knew? like 
became adults in Vegas, if you know what I mean, but like (laughs) (laughs) that were actually raised there. I had no idea. Um, And so, but in Vegas, you were around a lot of racial diversity. So you had the diversity in your performing arts friendships with giftings and, you know, weirdnesses. And then you had this racial diversity. How has being surrounded by such diversity um, influenced your very important work? I'll tell you, the most important part of that was the time period that I was in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. It was when I was a kid. Right. Mm -hmm. So growing up, when you're around so many different people, you just don't know any better. You think that that's how the entirety of the world Mm -hmm. is. And I joke quite a bit. Chapter two of my book is called Las Vegas is a terrible place to raise a racist, because at the time growing up there, it didn't occur to me that um, people had a problem with my blackness. Like I was very, very aware that I was black. I was keenly aware Mm -hmm. to it. I just didn't realize that my pro- my blackness was a problem for some people mm-hmm. until I left and went to other places. And I talk about that in my book in a door made for me. Mm-hmm. The first time I really experienced mm-hmm. um, that my blackness was a problem. But what I'll forever be grateful to Las Vegas for, even to this day, I was just back on a couple of speaking gigs a couple of weeks ago at UNLV. And I was looking out into the audience thinking like, I don't know if you all realize this, but this is not every day. This isn't normal in other places. Mm -hmm. Like I've lived in the South now for 20 years. I lived in, I live in Nashville, Tennessee Mm -hmm. now for 20 years. And there's certain places that I can go, even in this town where I look around and go like, there's movie theaters I can go to where it's only white people in attendance. And the only black people there are behind the counters, Mm -hmm. like working or serving people. Mm -hmm. And and I'm like, this is not accidental. This is Mm -hmm. history that you are a group of white people all in one place and you are getting served like the people here are transports from other parts of town to work to serve you. This mm-hmm. isn't accidental. Yeah. And though you're not thinking about it and you're not recognizing it, myself as a black man, I walk in this environment and those are the first things that I see. In Las Vegas, I, I didn't have that. That's not to yeah. say that Las Vegas doesn't have its own racial issues. Let me be very clear. Yeah. Like yeah. As, as we speak right now, um, I'm not sure when this is going to be shown, but right now it's the day after the election, the mm-hmm. midterm elections, and Nevada takes forever to count <laughs> um, their ballots, like forever. Yes, notoriously. And, and so I'm not saying Nevada and Las Vegas don't have their own issues, but I'll tell you, I will be forever grateful growing up in an environment where when I look to my right and to my left and in front of me, were so many incredibly beautiful people that did not look like me. They didn't believe like me. Um, They told different stories than I told. They had different hearts and um, different achievements that I had. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea how gold that was going to be when I was growing up. And now that I look back, I literally wrote as a chapter in my book. Yeah. I, um, So like you, I went to a really diverse middle school and you could really probably, I don't know what the real statistics are, but it's probably split three ways, white, black, brown. And, um, and I felt really, uh, privileged to be surrounded by that. I know that Eric Mason, perhaps someone asked this question before him, but Eric Mason and woke church asks, says that every black person knows the moment when they realized that their blackness was a problem. Like every, every black person knows that, that moment. And unfortunately for me and my whiteness, it was much later in my life. You know, I don't know how old you were when you went um, to your grandparents and and the door was, was shut on you. But, um, it, it was much later for me that I realized that I had kind of breathed in this smog because I didn't Mm. feel like I had. Right. Because I grew up in this very, where it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. And sure. so you could have asked me. So I was, let's see, I went to a new high school because I moved that was right. very white, predominantly white. And it was a rumor, a rumor started um, because I went to a very diverse middle school that I dated black guys. Mm. Okay. So, so that rumor was circulating. Sure. And in that moment, I could have told you that. I treat everybody the same. I don't think that race is an issue. And yet the existence of this rumor was something that made me feel so panicked Hmm. for what Hmm. I was trying to do socially as I started over in high school. Sure. And it's not until as an adult that I had to confront 
what I said with my mouth and what I held in my heart. Right. That those two things could not be simultaneously true. Right. And so as a white person, so as, as, you know, talking about this issue as a black person, I realized then at this moment that my blackness was a problem for me, I realized then at this moment that racism was a problem for me also. Right. And how lucky you were if you did only date black people. I mean, sweet. (laughs) What a gift that was to the world. To you, by the way, Tyler, (laughs) who, who, who is that guy? (laughs) <laughs> oh, um, okay. So, so let's talk but about, wait, let me say this. Let me, let me yeah. say this. Yeah. That's huge that you were able to address that, that you were able to recognize that and you were able to pull from that is to make that a part of your story. Mm. Cause I'll tell you, there are a lot of people that are out there that will just simply say like, yo, you know, sure. I had some tendencies or I had some things in my life and, and they won't call them out or name them or be mm-hmm. able to address them. But the fact mm-hmm. that you're able to go, this was a very particular specific moment shows how much growth you've, you've had. And, um, I appreciate you doing the work there for real. Well, well, it's, I, what has helped with that is understanding racism as smog, like something mm-hmm. that you just take in, even if right. it's unwillingly, because what, what happens I think is that we're like, well, I'm not a racist because I'm a nice person. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. niceness and racism obviously can't coexist. And so sure. we're so afraid of that term being called a racist that we refuse to confront biases. Right. And so I would argue that every white person needs to go back and realize a moment where what they might say with their mouth but hold in their heart isn't isn't consistent. For sure. So, For sure. Um, Okay, so let's talk about before you call the cops. That sure. first started in 2018. Yeah. That was first filmed in 2018, and then new resurgence in in 2020. Um, what what prompted this? So, in the very first uh, chapter of my book, it's it's called "If She Only Knew," and it's an experience of me walking, basically just taking a walk and experiencing this older white woman who. Um, I scare kind of no matter what I attempt to do with myself. She just gets scared based on just looking at me, no matter what I do, no matter my smile, no matter taking off my bandana, my, my glasses, there was nothing I could do to kind of keep her from Mm -hmm. being afraid. And, um, this thought and concept just stuck with me for, for such a, a a while and had such an imprint and around 2018, this is two years before George Floyd when um, we were seeing other black people be killed on camera and I was having to deal with Allison man, I was having to deal with a number of white individuals saying to me, you know what, Tyler, if you just, you know, um, if you just listen to what the cop said, you'd be fine. Or you're one of the good ones. There's no way that you would get pulled over and any, and you would cause a threat to any. And I'm hearing all these things, Allison, thinking to myself, like, you just don't, you just don't get it. You don't understand that my blackness is a threat to people no matter what I do. Mm-hmm. And when I, when I set up to do before you call the cops, and this, this is your first time listening to this or don't know who I am, please feel free to Google it or see it. And if you haven't seen it, congratulations to you for not being on the internet for the past four years. <laughs> <You're right. 'Cause laughs> pretty much everybody in the world has seen it right now. But, um, it's a video that I put together where I just basically look straight dead into the camera and talk about myself. It's three minutes of me saying, Hey, before you call the cops, I want you to know. And then I go on a list of things saying things like, I love my mother. And if you got to meet her, your life would be better. And that I hate bananas. They're disgusting because they are. And that spiders are, I'm, I'm afraid of spiders and that I love, I can tell you every single um, lyric to the musical Oklahoma, but also to every single lyric to the NWA straight out of Compton album. And I just kind of talk about how I, I love basketball and hockey. And what I was really doing in that, in that time period. Um, and I'll, and I'll be honest with you, Allison, I wasn't purposely setting up to humanize myself. That wasn't the, Mm, the, I wasn't, that wasn't my goal, right? Like I wasn't thinking I'm going to say this now and people are going to feel a certain way about it because I'm humanizing myself. I genuinely was thinking, Hey, before you call the cops, I want to tell you a few things about myself, because if I tell you these things, what you might do is think, Oh, my son is also afraid of spiders or (laughs) hates bananas. Or you might hear, listen to me and think to yourself, Oh, 
I'm similar to that person, right? But what ended up echoing and ended up being like what took the video viral in 2018. And then again, when I was, compl- I wasn't even on the internet in 2020 and it made it viral again after George Floyd. And you know, all the story, cause you read my book, but, um, is that when, when the Huffington post called me, like I released it on a Friday night in 2018. And then on Monday, the Huffington post reached out to me and the, the idea of me humanizing myself was what was the big deal there. And I was thinking, I, this was never setting out to humanize myself. Black people should not have to humanize yourself, yeah. but the fact that this is what people are clinging on to, if that's the deal, if that's going to save a life, then fine. Then then that's yeah. fine. Yeah. And once that happened, people started saying, this is um, extraordinary. And I remember thinking to myself, because I almost didn't even turn it. I didn't almost didn't even post it. I, I had sent it to a friend of mine that night and she replied back, my friend Lisa, and she was like, yo, this, this feels holy. And I was like, well, mm. I should probably post this. And I, I posted it and not thinking, I, thinking to myself, nobody wants to listen to me talk about myself for three minutes, but instead the world started to go, whoa, like these black people that we're seeing die in the street, like love their moms the same way that I do. Yeah. And then black folks who were watching it, you had yeah. different reactions, right? Because not all black, because black people are not all monolithic, but you had a lot of black people that were watching it and they, and they were going, that's me right there. Like, amen, bro. Like, and, mm-hmm. and, and so in 2020, you had people doing their own versions of the video that started to circulate and mm-hmm. was, was really cool. But you yeah. also had other black people that were like, bro, what makes you feel like you had to humanize yourself? Like, that's some nonsense that you're doing. Like, resentful don't, that it's you know, and they were or... resentful and they were angry and they were going, you don't have to, to humanize yourself to anybody, which then at first where I was a little offended by the idea that I, that people yeah. were attaching to the humanizing part, it then turned into this other piece where I really began to feel this way, Allison. If my singular three minute video helps save a life. Yeah. Call me whatever you want to call me. Like I'll make that video a million times over. And, um, it really did end up having an effect that I could never imagine, which then allowed me to open up doors to have other content that people received yeah. so willingly. Yeah. And they're not wrong that you shouldn't have to. And yet here we are, you know. Um, So you hold proximity. That word comes up so often in your work. And you hold proximity as this requisite practice to building empathy. Um, And you believe that the most profound way to address injustice is to become proximate to it. Um, and so when you're up close, when you, I mean, think about this, just matter of factly, it reduces confusion, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're Mm -hmm. up close, um, it might even reduce say skepticism. Um, you're, you're right there and it's not confusing anymore. Things are cleared up. I see better. Um, the the debate disappeared. It's, it's why, it's why front row seats are so expensive at sporting events, right? Like, (laughs) (laughs) like I can see, I can see what's happening. Right. Um, Right. And so if we make ourselves proximate then we can play a part in transformation. Um, and so the the Tyler Merritt Project is all about proximity. Can you tell us about the Tyler Merritt Project? Yeah, sure. Let me, let me give you an example about proximity for a second. Um, this is kind of a simple way, I think, to, to draw this picture. It's really easy to say, um, I know a gay person or... I don't have issue with gay people or, or sure, blah, blah, blah is gay. It's another thing if your daughter or your son comes out to you and you then suddenly have to walk through what is life going to look like for them if they decide to tell the world who they love and how that feels. Like suddenly it all changes when you go, but wait a minute. This now affects me. I now love someone who loves differently than I do. It suddenly, it suddenly does not become just an idea or a concept anymore. It now becomes something that you have to wrangle with on a very specific way. Now you have, now all of your feelings change about how you feel about gay people because it is now literally in your home. When you have something that is in your home, under your roof, um, you are forced to walk with it in a way that um, 
leans into empathy, that leans into asking the hard questions, that leans into what would I do if dot, 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 dot. Mm -hmm. And though that's a very specific um, scenario and situation, um, it's that kind of proximity that I believe can really change the world when we begin to go, okay, you know, I'm a six foot two black dude with dreadlocks and you are a white woman with kids and married and living wherever you are. But when I begin to ask about how you grew up, when I begin to ask about how did that really feel when you went from one school to the other school and people attach that thing onto you that you only like black dudes, or now that you're married, what are some of the real struggles that you're walking through? When was the last time you cried and why? And I began to understand some of the mechanics of who you are as a person. I am then left with a choice as to what I want to do with it. Mm -hmm. Do I, do I want to love you through it? Do I want to choose to accept some of the, the rough parts of who you are? I'm then left with the responsibility of what I can do with that. And I can either choose empathy or not, but at least now I have the choice. Yeah. But if I don't take the opportunity or chance to come close to you, to really lean into who you are, to really try to see the world in the way that you do, then um, I'm just guessing. Yeah. And in the Tyler Merritt Project, my simple hope with the Tyler Merritt Project was to get people to love each other more and to love each other better. If I were to just break it down, the simplicity of what the Tyler Merritt Project is, it, is it was... How can I get people to love more? And the more time I spent creating content and building a community, it occurred to me that the only way that I could do that is to build spaces where people could listen to each other. Or, or nowadays, if something happens in the world, it could be something as simple as um, Leslie Jordan passing away mm -hmm. or yeah. um, the release of Black Panther. I'm just using that as an example. Uh, uh, something that people are talking about in the world, they can usually come online the Tyler Mary Project or where I am on social media and hear a singular thought from a black person. <laughs> now, I don't speak on behalf of all black people, but I have learned to communicate in a way where people can kind of pick up on what I'm saying. A perfectly good example is, is I cast a vote yesterday. Um, and because it's midterm elections. And I went and posted something within the Tyler Mayer Project in that community. And I just stopped and I said, you know what? This feels different right now. Mm. And as a black man, I usually walk into a booth and the only thing I'm thinking about is myself as a black man in America. Mm. But this time when I walked into this booth, I was thinking about women more than I ever have in my life. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about parents with trans kids. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about anybody who's ever lost someone to gun violence, especially children. And so I went into, uh, you know, into my community there in the Tyler Merritt Project and just posted that information. It just allows people to come and go, here's another um, outlook of somebody who either looks like me or doesn't look like me and, and, and being wildly transparent with who they are. Mm -hmm. So I really believe the more that we do that, the more, um, the more chance we have of making a difference in the world. Yeah. But, but here, here's the crux of it for me, Tyler. Or, I mean, I, I, I think you'll agree, but you know, so people from the back. Um, so I, let's just kind of keep the, um, the sports analogy going. So mm -hmm. if you get if you, the expensive seats up front, right. So, but people from the back, they can learn from people from the front, right. And then they can be inspired or, or curious to say, oh, I kind of, I want to see what, what he's seeing, right? You know, sure. I want to get up close too. And so if, if I was picturing Tyler Merritt, like right behind the plate, um, at the world series, let's say, yeah. and you are, you're watching the ump and you're watching him make his calls and, uh, you know, what he's getting right, what he's getting wrong. And in your way, the Tyler Merritt way in your way that makes us laugh and cry and think and shake our fists and, and what have you. Um, because of your way, there is this experience that you're having that makes people further back want to have it too. And if mm. I could name mm. 
it's curiosity, right? And if I could yeah. name what your way is, it is, um, it's storytelling. It's yeah. storytelling yeah. that makes us want to see for ourselves. Um, that's what makes the, the proximity transformative. So it's like, um, okay, so I can see more clearly now. Um, if, <laughs> if, if proximity is, um, a virus, let's say, yeah. um, I feel like, um, uh, sorry, um, storytelling is the best transmitter. Okay. Sure. So, sure. <laughs> so it's like storytelling the is the spit. Okay. Storytelling is the spit Spor storytelling is sharing a spoon. Yeah. And so now I also want to be more proximal to these things going on. Tyler Merritt has made me want to get closer to this thing. Okay. Right. So, right. um, you as a master storyteller, can we talk a little bit about, we already know that proximity can transform us, but how can you tell us specifically like storytelling, being able to pass it on? Why does that work so well? You know, not to get all biblical about it, but anytime Jesus later in his life was like, I want to communicate a point. He was usually like, yeah. let me tell you a story. Yeah. Almost any time he wanted to be <laughs> impactful with yeah. a group of people, he would go, oh, are we call? Are we all paying attention? Cool. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a story. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're engineered for that. Mm -hmm. Think about it as you have kids, how many times you've, you've been reading from them as, as tiny, tiny babies. We are mm -hmm. engineered to be able to attach to stories. Mm -hmm. And those of us that can tell, tell them well, I think we have a weight to be able to yeah. do so like a weight, like a, a heavy weight mm -hmm. to be able to do that thing. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, man, Allison, as I speak throughout the United States, um, gosh, there's moments where, where I was just in Decatur, Alabama this last weekend. There was a moment where I was telling a story out of my book and I was looking out into the audience and seeing the focus of these individuals and you felt like you could cut the tension with a knife, mm -hmm. but it was simply based on me saying, let me tell you this story that was integral to who I am. And hopefully by telling you this in a way that um, can kind of pierce through the darkness a little bit, mm -hmm. you can attach to me. And when it's done mm -hmm. right and when mm -hmm. it's done well, mm -hmm. it, it, it works. Yeah. That's that's who we are. That's why we love yeah. TV. That's why we love podcasts. That's why we love yeah. murder mystery show. Or like, that's why we love murder shows. Yes. You know what I mean? Right. We, yeah. are, we are engineered um, to too long for that piece of the puzzle that is storytelling. Mm -hmm. We're engineered for that. Yeah, it's good. We've been gathering around fires for centuries doing it. For yeah. centuries. And and I you know, I've also been saying this a lot too because I <laughs> I I really do believe this is true. So take this however you want, but in a in a world where we are continually being asked to follow people through social media, through mm -hmm. this that, and the other, yeah. not everybody deserves to be followed. Amen. People got a lot of confidence and a little charisma. That's kind of <laughs> all it takes. <laughs> True. And and I'm telling you, not, not uh, all of our stories are important, but I think that we, we have the option to, to figure out what kind of stories we're going to allow to really like stick to us and help and change who we are. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's something about the method of storytelling that allows us to not feel so manipulated. We can arrive places on our own. You know, sure. it's like, I'm not forced into some position. I can listen to you, this thing. And so, whereas like an argument feels like you're coming from somewhere morally superior than me, but a 100%. story is, this is just your thing that I can either take or leave. It's that like, what you were saying earlier about, I have a choice to right. be empathetic, but that choice is really empowering for us i think and I th that choice when that choice lies on you my hope yeah. my hope with, with what i do in the world is my hope is that through the things that i give out into the world it makes you want to make the right choice yeah the better right, choice right um and not just see that something is maybe right or wrong but hopefully when you're left with a choice on what to do there, you're able to go, okay, what steps can I, what steps can I take to do the next right thing? Yes. Yeah. And that's my hope. It's so good because when you think about, I mean, it's risky 
it's risky giving people a choice. We would so much rather sure. strong arm something with certainty, right? It's like, let's, right, let's right. just, but I mean, God was the biggest risk taker of all. Like we could have, right. we could either accept it or reject it. I mean, he's such a stickler when it comes to free will. So it makes sense that, you know, all these, all these choices are, are what feels good and right. Um, okay. So Tyler, you are really, really vulnerable. Okay. Like, so, and I take my coffee black, like you didn't have to tell us all that, Tyler. But Can I tell did. you, Allison, <laughs> when I took my book came out September 13th of 2021 mm-hmm. and at on September 12th at 1159 PM, oh, I was going, yeah. I don't know if yeah. I made the right decision here. Yeah. That just, you know, I'm like, re- yeah, no, genuinely. I, feel you. I, I hear that. Yeah. In those, in those, if you haven't read my book yet, you're going to read it and come back and remember this moment and go, mm-hmm. oh, I get what Allison and Tyler were talking about. There were moments mm-hmm. where I went, I don't. Is it going to be worth it? And it was a really big, huge experiment. But I also felt this way, Allison. I felt like if we're, if I'm really going to gamble on this proximity thing, Mm -hmm. I can't just let you like kind of in. Yes. And I will be the guinea pig in this and I'm going to let you all the way in. But then when you're done, when you close this book, you are then left with what to do with everything that you have now. Yeah. And what I think ended up happening and why I take my coffee black has been so successful is that people listened to me or read my stories and they began to see themselves in them. It, 100%. You know? Yeah. You know. And it's so brave. I mean, I think that, you know, we're conditioned to, um, to love a risk. I mean, you jumped without a net. That's just impressive. You know, yeah. I, I think, I think everybody like if, I don't think I'd be the only person like pumping my fists and getting chills when you said at 1159, I was like, hold on, <laughs> you know, like, I get it. I totally get it. And right. you did it. And I was and like, I- cause it wasn't like, it was, it wasn't like it was an email that I sent to one person. I was like, this now is going to be sitting in target. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Like this now is I, this is in the world yeah. and has Jimmy Kimmel's on the name of my b- cover mm. of my, b- basically saying, please read this thing that is, Deeper and more personal. It's not going to fly under the I've radar, Tyler. <laughs> What's that? It's not going to fly under the radar, Tyler. <laughs> yeah, there's no way to fly under the radar, and yeah. it was um, it was a gamble. Yeah, and yeah. it was a gamble that ended up paying off. And yeah, and I could I couldn't be more thankful for it. Yeah. So, so let me say this dis- too. Go ahead. Let me say Sorry. thank you for reading my book. Hmm. And, and and listen, I know that's what people do. They read books. Mm-hmm. But I mean it when I say it, this, Alice. I'm like, thank you for not only taking the time to read it, but go back and listening to the audio book. And mm-hmm. thank you for um, allowing my stories to play a part in your life. That means yeah. the world to me. Yeah. Well, they're really great stories. Highly recommend. Um, I would imagine when you made that decision, it was a very deliberate decision. I mean, it was, and, and in fact, holy, I mean, I feel like, you know, once you kind of put a stake in the ground, it's easy to, you know, you know, question that, but it was obviously made during a really, um, inspired time. So yeah. It, do you think that vulnerability is a necessary part of storytelling? Um, I, I think this people all the time now ask me since I've had, I have two books out, <laughs> which I feel like nothing considering I have so many friends that have like nine or 10 or 14, but, um, They'll ask me all the time, like, hey, I'm writing a book. What do you think? What's some good advice? Or I'm trying to tell a story with some good advice. And I'll say to them, um, if you're writing something and it scares you, you're probably barking up the right tree. Yeah. Like if you're writing something and you and it scares you a little bit, you're probably putting something on the page that somebody else is going to relate to. Yeah. Now, I was incredibly intentional with I take my coffee black. Like I knew that I wanted to slowly bring you into this thing. And slowly begin to pepper in some history and education in it. And, mm-hmm. and, but all while being funny. So you didn't really know that it was happening. Yeah. And like you're laughing and kind of getting these references and all this. But I knew like around chapter, well, the reason why chap- chapter five is called, um, I have 99 problems and most of them are women, right? That was basically a setup for where we were going. Like I knew come chapter 10, 11, 12, we were going to take a hard left into Mm -hmm. this no longer just being about my mom, my dad, and being funny and about being black. I knew that I was about to let you into who I was, whether you were ready or not. 
I had now trusted you with these smaller things, like how I grew up in junior high, yeah. walking through a relationship with my mom, walking mm-hmm. through a relationship with my dad, mm-hmm. coming to know God. Mm-hmm. Like I had eased you into all yeah. of these things that by the mm-hmm. time we got to the end, um, you were invested in enough now that yeah. I could say to you, let me tell you about how shitty I am. Yeah. <laughs> you As know? opposed to starting that off right off the bat. Right. Yeah, to yeah. where a lot of people, when they first read in their book, they were like, I don't know if you're the antagonist or the protagonist of this story. <laughs> like, I don't even, I don't even know yeah. if I like you anymore. Right. You know? And uh, there was something about that, though, that ended up being the thing that paid off when you closed the book. You were like, I miss this guy. Yeah. He told you me know? the truth. Yeah. You know, there's there's something about, uh, especially in Christian circles, where it's like, I don't know, people, maybe this is just me, but it's like, I can read a book or I can see a speaker or whatever and think, oh, great. You were born great and you live great and you're going to die great. And that's because you're great and I'm normal. And so it's right. so easy to dismiss what they say because, oh, fantastic. You're on the other side of sin. Good for you. I'm not, you know, sure. so I, I really, I just thank you for how vulnerable you were. You're right that it really does matter. And it was a great and, Well, and I'll tell you, I think women do a much better job of that as writers than men yeah, do. Maybe. Like, there are a lot, there are a ton. You have Glennon and my mm-hmm. girlfriend. She's, they're, they're really great at being able to be like, I, this is my life and this was hard. Yeah. Right. Like they're able to go, this was hard. But yeah, men, in the middle, not when it's all over and finished and tidy with the bow, but like in the middle, in the mess. Right. In the middle. Right. Right. But men, we tend to have like a, a wall that we walk up to and go, oh, that's enough. Yeah. Like yeah. we, we've gotten here, but we don't want to go past this. Yeah. And, I just didn't have that wall. Yeah. I was just kind of like, eh, you it's know, this little cap um, on humanity, you know, <laughs> like exactly. I didn't have anything to lose there. Okay, so as as we close, Tyler, I would love to know um, what you're hopeful for. I would love to know where we can all follow. So, what is what is something that you're hopeful for? Man, <laughs> I'll tell you, and it's hard for me to not get emotional when I when I think about this. So. I have, although I am an, I'm an only child, I've adopted people as my brothers and sisters in my life. And uh, when you've walked in such close proximity, it's hard um, not to, like my best friend, James, who I call my brother, James, trying to convince us that we're not brothers is almost impossible. You know, um, with that, I have nieces and nephews, um, specifically Zoe and Declan who are 10 and 12. And then I have Gigi and Bella in Las Vegas and um, just, all, just kids. Tell you, Allison. Um, huh. When I look at these kids nowadays, when I see the brightness in their eyes and I see the, um, the ability and willingness to love um, just unleashed in a way that I couldn't have possibly began to understand and how to love when I was younger. Mm. Or I'll now have Zoe and Declan are now realizing what Uncle Ty Ty does, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're not just like, oh, you're in TV shows, but they're also like, you have a voice out in the world. And they're really, they're really beginning to understand that. Yeah. Um, what I do to them isn't foreign because to them, it's just life. Yeah. It's just what you're supposed to do. And when I look at how so many of these kids are growing up and our ability to lead them into a future that is bright and beautiful and accepting and loving. Um, that makes me hopeful when I see, you know, when elections happen to me, they may not go the way that I, I want or, or that I, I think to myself as a black man in America, I'm like, Oh, the struggle that we've had over years and years and years, you know, I'm able to look at a young black man um, now and go, man, I've, I've had some incredible people before me fighting on your behalf. Hmm. Now you have me fighting on your behalf and I can't wait to see the kind of fight that you put into the world. And um, the kids give me hope. I know that's so um, kind of basic and ordinary, but I remember, uh, 
I know we're closing your system. It sounds like I'm opening a whole other can of worms, but I, I it doesn't, I'm pretty, it's pretty Googleable to know that I was, I, I'm pretty Googleable to know that I, I was diagnosed with cancer um, in 2020, a really rare form of cancer called liposarcoma. And I had to have a surgery to have a 28 pound cancerous tumor removed from my abdomen. And it was a whole thing. But I remember the night before I went into surgery, thinking to myself, if I don't come out of this, will I be okay with what I've given to the world? And when I would think about that, I would think about all of the kids that I had had in my life that had been around me. Yes. And I thought to myself, I think I have left them with all of the goodness that I've yeah. had. So if for some reason I'm gone tomorrow, <laughs> this thing that is inside of me is going to carry on in these kids. And that, Allison, that right there, that gives me hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have a beautiful legacy. And I agree with you. The kids are all right. <laughs> I think they're doing great. <laughs> okay. Where do we follow? Oh, um, I, listen, you can follow me on at Tyler Merrick Project on everywhere. At TTM Project on Twitter, at Tyler Merrick Project on Instagram, YouTube. Go to TylerMerrickProject.com, Facebook, the Tyler Merrick Project, just the Tyler Merrick Project. You can mm -hmm. find me um, Double R, there double T. on all those things. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Um, I can't thank you enough. You will never know the depths of my gratitude for you saying yes to be here. Um, we could talk forever about so many things. I know it. Um, musicals, movies, Belle, Biv DeVoe, Taylor Swift. Um, <laughs> we, um, we have to do a part two at some point. I Allison. know. I know. Like lament. Um, yeah. D diversity being more than just optics. Like I just, I have so many things that, that I would love to discuss with you, but, um, I, you know, God is always beautiful, Tyler Merritt, but he is, if I knew your middle name, I'd use it. Tyler James Merritt. Um, but if he, <laughs> but God is always beautiful, but he is especially beautiful through you. Thank you so much for your very important work and for saying yes to be here. I appreciate you. Allison, thank you so much. And you are now my new homie, so you're Yay! not going to be able to get rid of me. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> okay. We'll talk soon. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Friends, I adore Be A Heart Design. Go ahead and look them up now while you listen and hit follow. Be A Heart Design is committed to creating and experiencing beauty. They create products that walk us through the joys and sorrows of life. Swaddle blankets, wooden puzzles, laptop sleeves, lunch boxes, digital planners, and my very favorite paper planner. This thing does not just keep me organized, but it also keeps me rooted in prayer. Everything that's created is designed to reflect God's goodness. Go to Be A Heart Design on Instagram and beaheart.com to check out the many gifts for special occasions. Christmas is just around the corner. Or just pick something up to let someone know that you're thinking of them or go pick up something for yourself. You'll love it. Good morning, Beefy. Good morning, Beefinator. Good morning, good morning. How are things? Things are good, Beef, but I want to talk about Tyler. I mean, <laughs> I feel like most of your guests are worthy of star struckedness. Um, <laughs> but I was um, extra starstruck with him. I just, yeah. I mean, he is wise in a way that it i think the white reason why it's so powerful is because it's like the opposite of preaching and he like brings mm -hmm. you along um with story i mean and of course he's dating our girl so that made it extra fun yes here you guys yeah. chat <laughs> yeah you know we spent some time talking about that i mean obviously i know you heard but it was there's something yeah. about story that kind of um brings you along instead of points you oh, yeah. along and it just makes him so approachable but also accessible like i feel mm -hmm. like some people major in chemistry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and tyler merritt majors in chemistry he all day he takes the charge of loving the person in front of him very very seriously you feel so seen and appreciated he is so fully present and the um outcome of that is just joy. Like there's such a joyful mm -hmm. experience. There's this story that Glennon tells about her and her girls being at some animal shelter and her daughter had kind of attached to, I don't know, a cat that was kind of the 
mangiest or something. I don't know. There was just something undesirable <laughs> about this little kitten. And so Glennon uh-huh. was perplexed. She's like, why do you like that one? And her daughter was like, I don't know. It just likes me. And so because it had kind mm-hmm. of been following her around or whatever. And so there's something to that. There's something about when someone just sees you and appreciates you and likes you that builds this whole chemistry of love and joy right. and so he just really really goes first and takes it seriously and it was one of my very favorite interviews it was so good and talk about being seen you know um this might sound naive it is naive but um i one thing that i he taught me was that i was just unaware that um it's necessary to hold eye contact longer mm. and intentionally smile back to let a black man know that I'm not afraid. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he was so descriptive in that experience yeah. and hurt yeah. and I'm not afraid. And, you know, I've done some of that work and I have enough people of color in my close community that there's, mm-hmm. you know, love and familiarity. Um, yeah. Um, and just recognition that I've gathered from very intentionally listening, but, um, you know, there's obviously a lot more work to do, Mm -hmm. uh, to combat what our friends are up against. Um, and I can do that. Yeah. That, well, that's just the thing is that it's easy work. Like it might mm-hmm. feel completely overwhelming to, okay, you know, I, w- I want to reverse racism in this world and then feel right. like that's an impossible task and then give up because you're overwhelmed versus no, I can smile. I can, I can maintain some eye contact. So if the right. opposite of a, a tall order is a short order, you know, we've, we've got a lot of short orders that we can do. I love that. We can do that. Yeah. Um, Beef, and I just want to tell you, I'm so proud of you and Center Saint Sister. <laughs> like that, that interview was just um, so powerful and, and all the people that you're getting to talk to and all the people that you're giving this important platform to, it's so important. And I'm so grateful. And I just can't wait to see what's next. Yay. 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 Love it so much. Thank you. Thank you, Beefy. Thank you, Tyler. See ya. Bye. Thank you so, so much for listening. Thank you for being here. A very special thank you to all guests and sponsors. A really special thank you to Taylor Schroll for mixing and editing. For more content, you can head over to Instagram at Allison M. Sully and TikTok at Sullivan Family TikTok. You can also check out Forte Catholic and subscribe there where you have a 25% chance of hearing me co-host. I am so grateful for all of the love and support that we offer each other here. Today's show was a production of Allison Sullivan in conjunction with the Forte Catholic Podcast Network. For more great Catholic podcasts, head on over to ForteCatholic.com slash podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.